Good afternoon, everybody. Um, and we're getting some chairs for the folks in the back. I'm Steve Clasco. I'm the president and CEO of Thomas Jefferson University and Jefferson Health. And I really, really, really want to thank you all for coming for so many reasons. But the most important reason is, if it wasn't for you, I would be in that snowstorm back in Philadelphia. So <laughs> if nothing else happens, thank you very much for uh, uh, making me come down here. Um, about two weeks ago, I got to give a keynote for Standard & Poor's, the rating agency. And um, the, the person before my keynote was a Standard & Poor's analyst. And it was actually pretty depressing because she basically said, we're downgrading the entire nonprofit health sector because basically NIH funding isn't going up and clinical revenue isn't going up and tuition isn't going up. Um, and it was like, um, it reminded me of a Woody Allen quote. Um, we're at, a, we're at a crossroads. One road leads to total destruction, the other utter despair. Let's hope we choose the right one. <laughs> so so, so why, why did she ask us to give the keynote at Jefferson? Because we've moved in the last five years from a $1 billion, two hospital, one campus entity to a $5.1 billion, 18 hospital, um, two campus entity. And our rating has gone up. Now you might say, well, why is that? And it really hit me, as I was just thinking about the couple minutes that I'd like to, to, to talk to you guys about, is that um, I got to work with Apple in the early 2000s. And this morning, we had dinner with uh, a breakfast with John Scully. And the interesting thing about Apple, if you remember pre-iPhone, Apple stock was 15, about 27 splits ago. Um, some of you probably have houses based on that, uh, on that stock. Um, um, and they had about 3% of the computer industry. And Steve Jobs had come back and everybody was waiting and saying, let's see what Steve comes up with. Everybody was thinking incrementally. Is it going to be a competitor to, to Dell, the laptop, because that was the big thing, or a competitor to Windows? So if you remember that one, Steve came out, here's our new laptop, bad laptop. Here's our new operating system. Walked out, came back and said, oh, here, one more thing. Here's the thing holding 200 MP3s, that, uh, the first iPod. Stock went down about 15%. People said, you know, he's either crazy or on drugs. I mean, he was on drugs, but he was not crazy. <laughs> and here, here's what was significant, and this is what it has to do with Jefferson. The fact is he recognized that the computer industry was going through a once-in-a-lifetime change from a computer industry to a digital lifestyle. And he said, we're all in. The difference between Jefferson and most other academic medical centers is we have recognized that healthcare and academics is going through a once in a multi-lifetime change from a business to business model, a business to consumer model, from a physician and administrator as the boss to a patient as the boss. So even if you look at our mission and vision, I'm sure so many places come down here, and if you look at their missions and visions of academic medical centers, it's always to be number one in NIH in funding or the number one hospital in, in the area. Our vision is, our mission is we improve lives. Our vision is we'll reimagine healthcare, education, discovery to create on parallel values. And our three, our three uh, values are be bold and think different, do the right thing, and put people first. So what you're going to hear about in our Vicki and Jack Farber Institute of Neurosciences, just as an example, is the fact that we came up with what seemed like a pretty obvious thing. Why should the patients have to go to where all the doctors are? Why can't the doctors go to where the patients are? So we have the ALS Center of Excellence in Philadelphia that got moved from a different institution for, for a simple reason. We do great research, as did that other institution. But we said, you're not going to have to go through the 12th floor for neurology and the 14th floor for neurosurgery. We're going to create a CRISP. Well, it's clinical and research integrated strategic program. So when you come down as an ALS patient, everybody will come to you. And I think as you start to hear from our both researchers and the leader of the Vicki and Jack Farber Institute of Neurosciences, you'll get a feel uh, for, for how different that, that is. How many of you have a connection to Jefferson, have been a Jefferson doc or whatever? Okay, so just three or four things that you probably don't know, and, 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 and then, then I'll have a chance to introduce our spectrum. We are now the number three fashion design university in the country after Parsons and, uh, and, and FIT, thanks to our merger with uh, Philadelphia University. We're also now the number two uh, women's basketball team in Division II in the country, <laughs> thanks to that. Who, who knew, right? Um, we are now the largest healthcare system in, in, in Philadelphia with, um, with, with 3,200 uh, beds. And we, have, we are the only one with five uh, leapfrog A uh, hospitals. 
Uh, oh, and by the way, um, we actually uh, were the number 20 most creative place in business, not just in healthcare, according to Fast Company magazine. So a very different Jefferson than, than many of you have, uh, have seen. A lot of what you're going to hear today was the vision of just a great a friend, a great board member, and a great couple that really understands how you can take the best of academic medicine and tie it in with patients. And so many of you know uh, Vicki and Jack Farber, but it was their vision that we have been able to, uh, uh, to accomplish through the Vicki and Jack Farber Institute of Neurosciences. I'd like to ask Jack to come up and say a few words. Thank you, Steve. Thanks for the kind words. Uh, I, don't, I don't speak extemporaneously as, uh, without any notes or anything, so you'll have to excuse me on that. Uh, Vicki, who's down here, my wife, uh, and I welcome you. I had to raise this a little, thank you. To what we believe will be a uh, not only interesting, but a very enlightening uh, presentation. Vicki and I have been privileged to be part of Jefferson for almost 35 years. As patients, and I've been a trustee, a term as a chairman, and advisor to several of the presidents. Over the years, we've known many Jeffersonians, researchers, physicians, and support staff. The overall strength, separate from the basketball team now, <laughs> has been a consistent culture of high ethical standards and consistent effort to benefit and improve patient care, which is what we're all really interested in being associated with. In 2002, we helped initiate a centralized research effort to attack neurological degenerative diseases and coordinate research from various departments, which had not been done before it, in most places. Our motivation was personal, it was related to the impact of ALS and Alzheimer's disease on our family. In 2015, Dr. Robert, Robert Rosenwasser, who you will get to meet a little later, and his associates developed what was a new concept of combining research and clinical care of brain-related problems into the Institute for Neuroscience, which was endorsed by Dr. Clasco and then the board. You may wonder, what, what was the big deal? As logical and simple as it sounds to put everything related to fighting a disease together, it was the first time for Jefferson, and we believe in general for healthcare. And if anybody has uh, can change that, we'd like to know, because we keep saying that we were first. <laughs> it was a transformational change in approach and a major positive disruption. I believe that this approach will be utilized in other health areas. The results have been excellent and continue to gain momentum. You'll hear more about that. You will hear about some of the amazing results today from Dr. Rosenwasser and Dr. Iacovetti. Vicki and I thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. So um, all of this doesn't happen easy. As my wife uh, keeps saying, you just make the speeches, everybody else works hard. So I, I want to thank um, all of the uh, amazing uh, trustees, uh, advisory board members, Jefferson leadership, the entire Noro team, and especially our board chair, uh, Steve Crane, for everything that you do. Could you guys please stand? And I also want to thank uh, Colleen and my great friends and really the parents of this event. Uh, the folks that uh, first gave us the uh, key uh, to Palm Beach, uh, the, uh, Jane and Leonard Corman. Jane and Leonard, thank you for everything you do. And last year, some of you were here to celebrate the Jane and Leonard Corman uh, Respiratory Institute with National Jewish Health, and that is doing fantastic. So over the cocktail hour, we can talk about that. So with no further ado, 
Um, one of the great things is, uh, President, you get to marvel uh, at, at some of the work that's being done. And I always try to think about um, who, who could win a, a Nobel Prize in our place? And um, the person you're about to, to meet is, is one of those people. <laughs> Did you win it already, Lauren? <laughs> I'm, so, I'm sorry, sorry about that. And by the way, she's a great singer. Ask her to do an opera, an aria. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Iacovetti is the director of our Stem Cell and Regenerative Neuroscience Institute. She's a fantastic researcher, and she really is uh, looking at amazing ways trans with translational research that can start to uh, affect how uh, entities can get into the blood-brain barrier. You'll get to hear a lot about it, and I think you'll be as excited about it as we are. So, Lorraine? Well, I'm going to have to lower this. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, OK. Uh, I also would like to start with a few thank yous. Uh, first of all, to all the folks at Jefferson who worked so hard to organize this incredible event. I'm, I'm really grateful. To my longtime friend and collaborator, Robert Rosenwasser, without whom I think I would have probably never become interested in stroke. Uh, I didn't start out in stroke, I started out working on Parkinson's disease, but I now do both and love them both. Um, so I'm grateful to that. And then thank you to all of you for taking the time to come here today and be part of this. So I hope um, you'll enjoy our presentation. So um, I'm gonna talk to you about the hope, we hope, the hope for stroke, but I, unfortunately I have to start with some very depressing facts to sort of place the research in some sort of context. So, oh, okay, I can move past that. So these are, these are just the depressing facts out there, the, what we live with now. Every 40 seconds, another American has a stroke. I'm not quite sure where I point this. One third of all seniors in this country will die with Alzheimer's disease. As many as one million Americans already have Parkinson's disease. And every year, 5,000 folks hear the devastating words, you have ALS. We call this the scourge of neurologic disease. And what's important to keep in mind is that the incidence of these insidious diseases, which disproportionately affect the elderly, is about to explode as all of us baby boomers age in, into our older years. Never more than now uh, has there been an urgent need to sort of come up with and accelerate our rate of discovery and just start thinking outside of the box in ways we haven't before. And so we're trying to do that at Jefferson. And the answer, the response to that desperate call was actually provided to us by, as you've heard, these incredible people, Jack and Vicki Farber, who uh, nearly 20 years ago, and I think I was the only one here at that time, uh, had this unbelievable vision of building the Farber Institute for Neuroscience. And as you've heard, what makes it unique is that we're organized into these disease centers. And these folks understood, even back then, that by bringing neuroscientists like myself together with world-class physicians like Dr. Rosenwasser, we could probably ask questions a little better and maybe come up with solutions that really impacted patients' lives. And so we're organized into many disease centers. I've only put a sampling on this slide. Um, and I tried to represent the folks that are here. Oh, though I see we lost one. Okay, it doesn't matter. The three that are encircled, encircled are the centers that I'm personally involved with. Um, and, uh, but I'm going to confine my remarks today to the first one, which is the neurovascular center where we do the stroke research. And if you look below that, you'll see that we have been so generously and kindly supported through many years by the two folks there in the center, Joe and Marie Field. And the work has also been supported in part by the Stem Cell Center, which I direct, 
And the lady in the center there, Kimberly Strauss, has also very generously supported that center. So you see it takes a village to get this job done, so thank you to all of you. So I'm going to start with some basics. Stroke injury. What happens in a stroke at the most basic levels? When blood is cut off from your brain, uh, or at least a portion of your brain, usually because of a blood clot, uh, the area that's impacted by that begins to die. The nerve cells begin to die. They lack oxygen, they lack glucose, and nerve cells begin to die, and it happens rather quickly. That kind of death happens within a matter of days. It's very acute. But then what a lot of people don't know is cells, nerve cells continue to die around that region in what we call the penumbra. And that happens over weeks and months. And that's usually caused by inflammation that was caused by the injury. And so our goal is to save as many of those nerve cells as we can. And um, to do that, because if we can do that, hopefully we can preserve brain function if we can uh, preserve enough of those nerve cells. And in my lab, we studied two approaches to doing that. We either are trying to develop reagents and drugs that can actually protect nerve cells from dying. They're able to try to prevent a cell that's at risk of death. And we're also looking at stem cell therapies that actually can repair uh, the brain in the case that damage has already been done. So I'm going to try to give you examples of each of these today. So I'm going to start with a molecule. If I had to choose a molecule of my own design that I thought was going to be a good neuroprotective agent for stroke, I would choose this molecule called dimethyl fumarate, or for short, DMF. Um, you'd want a molecule that could act as an antioxidant, so it could save those nerve cells in the beginning when they're deprived of oxygen in those first days. But you'd also want one that has anti-inflammatory properties, so it could save the cells in the long term as well. And DMF is already being used safely in MS patients. And it has both of those properties. So we said, OK, let's give it a try. Nobody's looked at it in stroke. Let's just give it a try. So because I'm a neuroscientist and not a physician, I go to the lab to do that. And we usually start with the very simple models. So you'll see on the left, uh, let me see if I can point to this. Oh, goodness, he's right. <laughs> if you touch it, <laughs> wait a minute, let's go back. There. Let me see if I can get the pointer here. OK. So in this case, we, we're studying stroke in a model that's actually grown in a Petri dish, in a plate. Um, and these little green things you see here are actually very healthy neurons that come from the area where we normally get strokes from our cortex. And they're quite happy growing in a plate. You can grow them for weeks and months. Um, but if you begin to deprive them of oxygen and glucose, like in a stroke, I don't know if all of you can see that, but there are little tiny red cells in this case. There's little tiny red cells forming here. Those are actually dying neurons. So green is life, red is death. If I continue to deprive that culture of neurons uh, of oxygen and glucose, within a day, every one of those green cells will be a red dot. They'll all be dead. But if we give this, this particular drug, DMF, to the culture, you essentially rescue about 90% of those cells. So that gave us a lot of encouragement. And we said, OK, let's go now look at an animal model of stroke. So we use a rat that's commonly used uh, as a stroke model because it models human stroke so well. Uh, if you look here on the left, these are like su successive slices through the brain from the front to the back of a rat. And this rat's been given an experimental stroke. We've tied off a blood vessel for two hours, and it hasn't been getting oxygen and glucose during that time. And in this case, life is red and death is white. So it's been stained with something called a vital stain. So if it's the tissue's vital, it stains red. And you can see just how large that stroke area is. It goes from front to back with a lot of the tissue dying. 
When we give DMF on the opposite side, so this animal got DMF within about four hours of having got, had a stroke, you can see we rescue much of the dying tissue. So, we believe DMF is totally poised for clinical trial. It's already safely being tolerated in patients, so it's fabulous that, that we have that already at, at hand. And we believe that it's, uh, we're working with the company now that makes uh, this drug called Biogen, and we hope that we can start a clinical trial at Jefferson on stroke patients using DMF. Now we're gonna switch gears a little bit, and we're gonna start talking about stem cells, uh, stem cells as possible therapies. So, uh, as you know, the brain, like other organs of your body, has a natural reparative process. So if it's been injured, it does try to repair itself. And thank goodness, after a stroke, we often see a period of spontaneous recovery in patients. And so, oh my goodness. <laughs> and, and so, um, these, uh, we believe that the basis of that reparative process has to do a lot with the stem cells that normally sit in your brain your whole life, and they do give rise to new neurons throughout your life. Um, people tend to think that your brain never repairs itself, but that's not really true. And what we were able to show in our lab, those little streaks of lightning are trying to show you that in a stroke, if you look at the little red dots, those are supposed to represent the places where stem cells live in your brain. They live in little niches together, and they actually increase dramatically after you've had a stroke. So your brain sort of knows it's been injured and it's trying to make lots of new neurons. And so you have this dramatic rise. And we thought if we could figure out what drives that process, what protein uh, and what pathway in the brain is important for driving that, we could enhance the natural reparative process. And we, after, um, I, you know, I'm reducing everything down. This is two years of several people's work in the lab, but essentially we discovered a protein that's made actually by your uh, blood vessels uh, called VEGF. You'll see scientists love acronyms, lots of initials, I apologize. Um, but believe me, the name is much longer and more difficult than VEGF. Uh, so we now know VEGF drives that natural process. And if we put VEGF into the brain, I'm not sure if you can see it, I can't really see it from here, but the little pink dots that you're seeing amidst that purple are the stem cells up in your brain. And if we add VEGF on the right-hand side, we actually, you can see the number goes up. And so we really believe that th this has the potential, at least, to be a new therapeutic. What's one of the problems with actually trying to move VEGF into the brain. However, we don't really want to have to go into your brain to give you VEGF. We'd like to just give it to you and get it into your bloodstream and have it go there. But one of the obstacles to that actually happening, and not just VEGF, but most things that we're trying to get into the brain, is that your brain is sort of covered. It's pictured here as a, hel a steel helmet. It's not really a steel helmet. It's a cellular and molecular helmet. But it actually really prevents things from getting up into your brain. That's a good thing. We really don't want everything roaming around in our, from our bloodstream up in our brain. But it can be a real obstacle to getting uh, drugs across that we want to get across, like VEGF. And people, as shown here on the, on the right, people have used all kinds of means to open the blood-brain barrier, some of them quite dangerous for patients uh, to experience. And so enter several uh, residents who actually Dr. Rosenwasser sent to me from his neurosurgery department. And over the last few years, they've been working on such an exciting project. So they have been trying to open the blood-brain barrier and succeeding using a method that's safe, that you can open it temporarily, you can get something in, and it closes back up safely, and you can do it again and again. So the way they've been able to achieve that is there's this little group of nerve cells in your cheek. It's actually very accessible. And you can stimulate that with a little stimulator that sits behind the ear. 
It sounds like science fiction, but it's already being done. So people that have cluster headaches have one of these little stimulators here, and they stimulate that little group of nerve cells called the sphenopalatine ganglion, again, the SPG. Uh, and what our neurosurgical residents did was uh, discovered that if you stimulated at a certain frequency for a certain amount of time, 10 hertz for 20 minutes, you could open that blood-brain barrier up. And you can see that here because if we put a blue dye into the bloodstream, normally your brain would keep it out, just like on this side. It, the blood-brain barrier would block it. Um, but when we stimulated on the right-hand side, you can see the whole right-hand side of the brain became blue. Oops, operating two things at once here. Um, and so we went back to VEGF, which is something we want to get across. And if you look on this side, when, without stimulating that SPG, um, most of the VEGF stays in the blood vessels up in your brain. It doesn't want to come out. But if we stimulate it, all the drug begins to leak out into the substance of the brain. And so we believe that this has, it's really one of the most exciting findings we've had. So we believe it's really maybe a new way to deliver drugs, drugs like VEGF, into the brain. So now I'm going to end with um, maybe uh, the most exciting and dramatic way of using stem cells as a potential therapy for stroke. So I've been talking to you about stem cells that you find in your brain, but there are also, as I'm sure you will know, a lot of stem cells that are located in your bone marrow. And bone marrow is also quite accessible. And so you can take the bone marrow out, you can plate it in a dish, and you can expand the numbers of cells so you get lots and lots of cells if you grow bone marrow for a few weeks in a dish. And then you can harvest it and put it in a needle and you can stick it up into the brain. And that's exactly what we did to, the, oops, forgot this was animated. That's exactly what we did here. Uh, this is a rat, this is a PET scan of a rat, and you can see all those pink cells again. Those are stem cells, only this time they're derived from bone marrow, and they're up in the brain. And truly the most exciting moment I've had in my career, really a eureka moment, I called Bob on the phone immediately and said, you're not going to believe this. The rats, after a stroke, the rats are very sick, much like patients. These rats, the next morning, were running around the cage, and I couldn't distinguish the animals who'd had a stroke from those that didn't have a stroke. So we were like, I mean, I had to repeat it a few times to truly convince myself, but we were excited beyond belief. In fact, we made a pact with each other. If we ever have a stroke, we know what to do. So uh, we don't exactly even know how they do this, which is sort of anathema to a scientist. But what we do know is the cells, unlike your brain stem cells, they don't become new neurons. So you're not replacing the cells you lost. In fact, they act more like a neuroprotective agent. They seem to save cells and lower the inflammation in your brain. And so as scientists continue to look for the true reason and the mechanism for how these uh, stem cells work in stroke, still folks have gone ahead and begun clinical trials. Um, the trials that are out there, there's only a very few, three or four. Uh, there is actually one in Florida, at Mayo, Florida. Um, but most of those um, trials use stem cell products that have been engineered. And so we would like at Jefferson to be the site up in the Northeast where this is done first. And we'd like to go one further. We'd like to use your stem cells because I think they will be tolerated better. They come from you. And so we're really excited about trying to get that off the ground. And the fields who've been so supportive of us are very excited about it as well. So, 
So the true hope uh, for stroke and actually any of the diseases I mentioned at the beginning is really that we take these discoveries that we make in our laboratories, we move them into clinical trials with our fellow neuroscientists in the clinics, and uh, we actually can get real therapies from out of this, this work. So on that positive and hopeful note, I'll turn it back to Dr. Klasko. So a few years from now, instead of adding flaxseed to our drinks, we'll be adding stem cells, right? OK, sounds good. Um, so for those of you who are in academics, um, we talk about, uh, it's like, uh, you'll never find somebody like this, but what we call a triple threat. Uh, an, an MVP in research, an MVP in education, and an MVP clinically. There aren't too many of them around anymore, uh, but you're about to hear from uh, one of them. Uh, Dr. Robert Rosenwasser uh, leads uh, the Department of Neurosurgery at Jefferson, and he's also the leader of the Vicki and Jack Farber Institute of Neurosciences. Uh, he's built Jefferson up to one of the most authored uh, research uh, neuroscience entities in the country. We're the second largest neurosurgery entity in the country with 36 hospitals that uh, use us uh, as a stroke center. And he's uh, viewed as one of the country's uh, top educators, uh, both to students, residents, fellows, and other doctors. And if there was a quadruple threat, I'd add the innovation part of it, because a good part of the reason that so many of, of these hospitals use us as their stroke unit is because of the amazing work he's done with robotics and teleneuroscience. So it's um, my real pleasure to uh, introduce uh, one of my uh, true heroes and the uh, leader of the Vicki and Jack Farber Institute of Neuroscience is Dr. Robert Rosenwasser. Thank you very much. If I run over, just give me the hook. Uh, but I, I too want to really thank uh, the Farbers for really uh, we talked about this probably 12 years ago, and it was a kind of a little premature to maybe do bring all the departments together, but through their vision and support, this has really happened. And research is so important because the care that we're able to deliver happened in the laboratory 10, 15, 25, 30 years ago. And I've lived that experiment because things that I did in the laboratory 34 years ago, we're now doing in patients, and when it seemed like a crazy thing. And I also really want to thank uh, all the team at Jefferson for making this possible, Elizabeth Dale and her team, and, and certainly Dr. Clasco. When I ever have a really crazy idea, uh, he's kind of my barometer, and I run it by him, and, you know, it'll, it'll be one of these, and yeah, go for it, you know, go for it. It's, it sounds pretty out there, so <laughs> let, let's give it a go. Um, so I really, it's been a great team to work with, and, and I really appreciate it. Two extemporaneous things that weren't in my talk. Uh, fortuitously, uh, there are two individuals here who were my mentors and colleagues. Uh, Dr. Michael O'Connor, uh, I, when I was a resident, he probably doesn't remember, I did some e epilepsy surgery. He, he established the first epilepsy surgical program in, in really the tri-state area and in, and in Pennsylvania, I believe, if not the East Coast, and taught me a lot. And early on, when I came to Jefferson, a lot of what I was doing they thought was snake oil, right, you know? But Dr. O'Connor really supported it. So I really want to ask Dr. O'Connor to, to, to and, and I, I, yeah. I, I had not seen him in about 10 years, and, and it was really great to see him today. And the other individual is Dr. Robert Sollett. Dr. Sollett uh, is a vascular and thoracic surgeon, and I did some carotid surgery with him when I was a resident. And, uh, and early on with the idea of carotid stenting, again, it was, we didn't have carotid stents. We were using biliary stents, but Dr. Sala believed in it and supported me uh, in the early days when I used to get stoned. I used to be up on stage giving a talk and people would be throwing things at me. So Dr. Sala, please stand up. Uh, just a little bit of history. And, you know, Jefferson is really rich in neurological history, and I think m many of you know that. But I just want to take a moment. This is the, gross, the painting of the Gross Clinic, which, which really is a world-famous painting. It's early American art. Um, Dr. Samuel Gross was the father of American surgery. He was professor of surgery at Jefferson. 
Um, and at, in, the, in the latter part of the 19th century, Philadelphia medicine was really the place in the world to come. And he was at Jefferson. And, uh, and, and so this was painted by Thomas Aikens, who, as we know, is a world, world famous artist. He actually painted himself into the painting. That's Thomas Aikens. And he's, he painted himself in the painting as being a, uh, as a resident. Uh, this actually is W.W. Keene. W.W. W. Keene was a professor of surgery at Jefferson. He took out the first brain tumor in the world in, in 1887, and the patient survived. And back then, they were all general surgeons, uh, but he really is uh, really the father uh, of, uh, of neurosurgery, if you will. And Philadelphia, going back, has a long history. This was the Turner's Hospital during the Civil War. This was located, for those of you that know Philadelphia, between what, what is now Girard College and Eastern State Penitentiary. And Turner's Hospital was built to care for, it was, it was really, again, a first in Philadelphia, it was the first neurological hospital because all the soldiers with neurological injuries were sent to the Turner's, Turner's Lane Hospital in Philadelphia from all over uh, the war, including the Confederate soldiers. And S. Weir Mitchell, who was a young neurologist at Jefferson, and W. W. Keene, who was a young neurosurgeon, they wrote the original text on injuries of the nerves. And so there's a rich neurological history, really, at, at Philadelphia and at Jefferson in particular. Well, you know, Lorraine kind of indicated to you and my day job, uh, I guess I had multiple day jobs, so with the hat I'm on today, uh, I've been a, I'm a vascular neurosurgeon, which means I deal with blood vessel problems and stroke and, and things of that nature of the central nervous system. But stroke, is, it's a terrible disease. 800,000 Americans, 800,000 individuals in the U.S. have a stroke annually. And it used to be the third leading cause of death, it's now the fifth leading cause of death. So we're saving more people, but it's the leading cause of disability by a factor of five, by a factor of five, far in front of cardiac disease, cancer, all the other illnesses, because if you look at the, the total number of patients annually, and obviously the cost to the patient, the cost to the family, the cost to society is really enormous, and, and, and it's, a, it's a, a significant thing. I am from the South, I'm from Louisiana, which is the stroke belt, because they they'll fry anything that can be fried. <laughs> Uh, and that's probably one of the reasons, I mean, right, who ever, ever had heard of a fried cheeseburger, right? You make the cheeseburger and you deep fry it, and, uh, you know, and, and so forth. But, but you know, you, it's a terrible disease, and I think uh, Elaine, uh, uh, Lorraine really indicated that. Many of the treatments that we're showing you 20 years ago, I used to have to open the skull or open the artery and really repair the artery. And, what we do now with catheters, and if you, if you take a catheter, everybody knows what the inside of the, the, the tube of ink inside your pen, those are kind of about the size of the arteries. And, and, here's, and nowadays, we either access through the artery in the wrist, called the radial artery that you can feel your pulse, or we act, access through the artery in the groin. And many of the leading causes of stroke are blockage of the carotid arteries in the neck. I'm sure many of you have known friends who've had carotid surgery, who've had blocked arteries. And this is, there's still a technique where we open it up because not everybody is amenable to this. But this is very similar to what was done in the heart. What goes on in the brain really trails what goes on in the heart by 10 or 20 years because the, the, the devices have to be more delicate, the ability to navigate there is more, much more difficult. To do an angioplasty in the heart, it's one turn. I don't know if there are any cardiologists here, but you know, it's, it's, it's very different. And so we've learned a lot from our colleagues in cardiology. And this is just an example how we go in through the groin and are able to do an angioplasty of patients who've had blockage of the artery in the carotid, which is a, either patients can present with some symptoms, but they can also have asymptomatic blockages. I'm sure many in the room have had ultrasounds of their carotid arteries to check them and so forth, but it really has changed the flavor uh, on how we uh, do this. Moving up the tree, to give you a sense of scale, this, this artery is this artery. So this artery is about five millimeters, which would be about the size of a big pen. Okay, that's the artery that goes to our brain. And this is what an aneurysm looks like. An aneurysm essentially is a bubble on a blood vessel. Everybody's seen a garden hose, develops a split, the liner pooches out, that's an aneurysm. And it can burst. And routinely, uh, up until 
In 95, when I came to Jefferson, we were doing these. It wasn't FDA approved. It was experimental. It was not even to the point of being investigational. Uh, but for the first time, we were able to navigate up the artery with a catheter that, again, is the size of, a, of the inside of an ink pen uh, to navigate with x-ray control and close off the aneurysm without opening the head. And Dr. O'Connor will tell you, he lived with, he lived with, with me when I was doing this, and there was a lot of skeptic, skepticism whether it was really going to work. Uh, but with perseverance, we did it. Um, I was one of the developers of the first generation of STEN, along with one of my colleagues at NYU uh, before I came back to Jefferson. And really, this stent is now on its seventh generation, the first generation stent we, we patented and, and manufactured uh, and had FDA approval uh, in the mid to, to late 90s. So it really dramatically changed how we treat this, this severe disease. Uh, and I just put this here for scale. So this artery, as you can see, is this artery at this point. It's a very small artery. It's a five millimeter artery. And this is a real patient. This is so dramatic. This is a patient who had a blockage of an artery. Um, and by the way, for disclosure, we have consent to do this from the patient and the family. Uh, but this is a young lady who had a stroke. Not all strokes occur in, in people my age. There are people who are very young who have strokes. This is a young woman who had three children. Um, she had a hole in her heart where many people do have a hole in her heart, which is called a patent foramenal valley and the blood clot traveled through that, went up and, and caused a stroke. And you saw the exam, she was totally paralyzed on the left side. She was transferred in by helicopter. Uh, we examined her on the table, um, I can move this along, but she had a blockage of one of the main arteries uh, on the right side of her brain. So her left side was paralyzed when she came in. And these are just some of the skills. Again, we're able to go in through the groin uh, we have a lot of little wires and tools that allow us to do this. You don't need to read an angiogram, but she's missing a lot of blood vessels on that side of her brain, and that's what a fluoroscopic image looks like. And you can see many of the devices we're using are really thin wires. It's like the size of various sizes of fishing wire. And they have rigidity and they have steerability that we do under x-ray control. And we, we actually go up and now can retrieve the clot and pull the clot out of the artery and reopen the artery. Here's the image of the skull. And there we are just going up and manipulating with catheters and so forth. And, uh, and here we're now opening more of the arteries. But let me take it to the point that's really compelling. Can you fellas help me get this to the end, near the end? Mm -hmm. No, not the next slide. No, the other way. Go back. Go back. I just kind of wanted to go to the end of this because you saw in the beginning she could not move her left arm. Can we just scroll through this and get this to near the end? Because this is what's compelling. Yeah. Let it play. Yeah, right about there. There's, and, and start it again for me. And here's a young woman who came in paralyzed, left side. Uh, we, we were able to treat her within six hours. I think she was flown from about three or 400 miles away. We now have the arteries open. And what's compelling, here's her exam after we took the clot on. She got on the table, she was paralyzed. Now she's able to pick up her left arm. And she walked out of the hospital. And this would have been a, a woman in her late 30s, three children, prime of her life, she could have been totally paralyzed forever on her left side, and we all know that the changes that makes. So it, it, it's re really remarkable with the tools that we now have. That started in the laboratory 30 years ago uh, and 20 years ago, because we didn't have these tools to do that. Well, as a result of our work, our network is now 37 hospitals across the region. Uh, via telemedicine and remote presence, we're, we're able to treat 87% of the patients at their local hospital so they don't have to travel. And we'll, this means a lot. First of all, it's a very time sensitive disease. It, the weather in Pennsylvania is not like this. It's, I think it's going to be eight degrees on Sunday and 
my wife and I are going back tomorrow to avoid the wintry mix on, on Saturday. So, so time is really very critical in getting to these patients. And through our network and remote presence, we can treat patients with intravenous clot busters who are six hours away. And our 37 hospitals, uh, we've published this. It's really gotten the governor's attention, not only in Pennsylvania, but in uh, in, in Delaware, New Jersey, and really across the country, because I'll give you a number. So the national average for patients who receive the clot-busting drug for stroke is about 3% nationally. In our network, because of our access to all these hospitals real time, our administration rate is over 15%. We're three times the national average. And what does that mean? What that means is we know that Patients who are treated with stroke have better outcomes, right? They have better outcomes. They can return to their normal activities of daily living. And Pam always is getting me on my math, but I'll, I'll use this number again. So early on, we tried to see, well, okay, we're saving these patients. We're treating them locally. They don't have to travel. What's the cost effectiveness? Are we, are we saving dollars? And just in the cost of transporting patients, the physical act of moving them from a hospital putting them in an ambulance or a helicopter and driving them to the hospital costs the state of Pennsylvania $6 million a year. So every year from the patients that we were treating in our region, every year, and this, that, those numbers are five years old. It's probably when we didn't have 37 hospitals. We're probably saving the state of Pennsylvania just in transportation costs alone about $10 million a year. That's real dollars. That's real dollars that can go to other things in society. And that's what got the governor's uh, attention, and I'm on the, the state uh, committee for telehealth because we published this information. Um, it's gotten national attention, and really remote presence has really allowed us to really go ahead with Dr. Clasco's vision of taking the care to the patient, even something that is high acuity, very time sensitive, that we can take care of very sick patients in, in a timely fashion. And let me tell you another first, which is great. So uh, I went to Dr. Clasco about this, I don't know, several years ago. Um, and again, it's a time-sensitive disease. So we're going to be the first university hospital, the first university center in our tri-state area that has a mobile CT. What this means, it's a, it's a mobile ambulance. It's a large ambulance. It's not the regular ambulance. It has a CT scanner in the ambulance. So this is the ultimate taking care to the patient. The patient has a stroke. They go pick the patient up. Here, there's a CT scanner in the back of the ambulance. We can scan the patient in the ambulance. We already have significant experience with telemedicine. We look at the patient, we examine them, we see the CAT scan. Even before they're brought to the hospital, they're gonna be treated. And we're the first university hospital to have this. This is actually, it's uh, I think being delivered next month. I'm hoping they'll let me take it for a spin, but I don't think they'll, they will. Uh, it's a big truck. So this is really an advance as well. You, t you heard from Dr. Yakovitti uh, about this. And Quo Vadis, where are we going? Where are we marching to? And I think that one of the things, places we're clearly gonna be going is stem cell therapy. There's, there's absolutely no doubt in our, in our mind that this works. The pact that she was talking about, I made a joke. I said, I have a tattooed on the bottom of my foot when I come in with a stroke, give me my stem cells. Because uh, I, I probably won't be able to talk to you. Um, but I think that this is really where it's gonna go. Uh, there's one program, there's one study currently going on, again, using the stem cells, a proprietary version of stem cells, which are what we call um, uh, allograft, which are someone else's cells, right? And that has all the immune problems. So we're actually looking at autograft, using our person's own cells, which won't have all the problems related to immune reaction, and doing that trial at Jefferson, and we hope to do that very soon. This is really exciting, and I'll, and I'll stop here. And this is rebuilding the brain. And we're talking about brain-computer interface. You know, there are patients who've had strokes where we just can't do anything. And this is really cyborg. So what we are doing, I have a little show and tell. I even brought the electrode, electrodes here to show you, um, that what we are doing in patients who are paralyzed, we actually implant the x-rays. We just had FDA approval to do this. And this has not been done in stroke, but we received FDA approval to do this. It's a brain-computer interface. In the region of the stroke, I implant this electrode. Uh, and then what we do is essentially computer recordings. 
and, and through, through algorithms, mathematical algorithms, this is then converted into mechanical movement. So you think about it, right now we're using exoskeleton, we're using a device that's motorized, so a patient will, who's paralyzed, they, they can think, I wanna move my arm, but they can't, right? But the thoughts are still there. So we're taking their thoughts, those signals, converting them, sending out another signal, and it moves a device which allows them to move their arm, right? Imagine just being able to pick up a cup of coffee, right? And where this is going, right now the devices are external, but we're going to be actually dissecting out the nerves and implanting the leads on the actual nerves that control the muscles, so eventually this will, will all be subcutaneous, just like if you have a pacemaker, nothing's showing, it's all on, on the inside. So there's really, really a lot of great things going on at Jefferson, and I'll stop there, and thank you very much for your attention. So we have, we have time for a few questions. Lorraine, do you want to get up also? Anybody have any questions? Uh, one, in the, yeah. one in the back. What? Okay, there's one in the back, and then we'll get you, you next, sir. How many times can you take bone marrow? I had stem cells done to my knee and my hip, and it worked. I agree with you 100%. But my question is, how many times can you extract bone marrow to be safe in your life? As many times as, you, as we need to, because it's always reproducing itself. There's no limit on the, on the uh, it's like your hair. Your hair is always growing. Well, could we not do that? Okay. <laughs> bad, bad analogy. Okay, sorry about that. Sorry about that. All right. Uh, you're, you're fired. You're now. You're, you're, your nails are growing, right? It's tissue that's always regenerating. The point is it's always tissue. Your liver regenerates. There's always tissue regenerating, and uh, we can take bone marrow as many times as we need to. That's not a problem. Does the age influence the success of the stem? That is a great question. We actually published a study, and it was one of the first studies that showed that there was absolutely no difference age. Age was not a factor of outcome for stroke. We treated, and we just, it's actually, it was just accepted for publishing, we treated a 102-year-old, okay? We treated a 115-year-old, the 115-year-old didn't do okay, but the 102-year-old the, uh, the lady did, and I went in and talked to her the next day, and I said, what's your secret? She says, everybody keeps asking me that. You know, and she was 102, totally functional, living by herself. If, if we had not been able to reverse her stroke with the technique I showed you where we went in and pulled the clot out, a 102-year-old with, with, who's paralyzed doesn't have a good outcome. But this lady went home, 102 years old. And so the data indicates that age is not an uh, indicator to not treat. There was no difference whether you were 60 or whether you were 95. Yes, sir. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Um, go, go ahead. I'm, well, I'm glad the gentleman before, before in front of me asked the question because uh, I had another one. But this is phenomenal because if you, if you see or if you've been in a hospital for 30 or 40 years in the military or academic, whatever, the average cardiologist, I'm not a cardiologist, okay? The average cardiologist who comes in and see in the ICU after a patient has been diagnosed with stroke, if that patient is over 90, guarantee they'll say the word hospice. Okay? Many times. Many times. And this is a nurse who's worked in these facilities for 40 years. Okay? And she'll tell you, because we've worked with neurosurgeons, and they know you too, the neurosurgeons. But it's phenomenal what you just said, because age to most doctors is a deterrent advanced age, I should say, is a deterrent to treatment. Now, is that, is that because of the money? Uh, and also, out of place, or TPA, the, blo the blood clot uh, clotting medication, or the, uh, the clot busting medication, whether it's out of phase or to neck phase, the new one coming on, most of the hospitals don't want to give it. Well, there's a big risk with uh, bleeding. But another reason, money. As far as I know, they're very expensive. The last neurosurgical uh, meeting we went to, 
That was one of the big things that the doctor said. This is very expensive to give this medicine. And they're, they're very old. What are we going to spend this money on somebody who's 82? Now they're talking about 82. Now 93? Are we going to pay all this and do all these things? What's the chance that this person is going to live? And what you're saying is much different. Well, look, I'll, I'll take a shot at that. I mean, I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I can tell you what we do, that, that, that by and large, we do, we do not look at age. I think what starts to happen, I mean, you bring up a good point. There's a limited amount of, of dollars that exist in the healthcare system. Um, so as we, where it will become even a bigger issue, frankly, is as we start to get into things like CAR T cells and some of the biologics that cost $400,000. And the issue is, you know, everybody should have access to them. As it is, we have a dollar to pay for and a dollar and a quarter worth of health care. And, you know, that, so that gets into a whole policy issue. But um, at, at Jeff, look, I mean, one of the things I'm very proud of at Jefferson, then, then we'll go back to neurosurgery, is, um, you know, we, we're able to keep our A-plus rating. We take care of everybody. We take care of more unpaid and underserved places than any place other than the state institution in Philadelphia that gets $150 million. So we're able to maintain a, a, a slim profit. We could maintain a much bigger profit if we didn't do some of the things that uh, uh, that, that, that they're doing. So I, I can only speak to what we do at Jefferson. I think you're right that there are some decisions made, especially by insurance companies, that will say, you know, uh, we're not going to approve this because the patient is X age, and that's a whole different policy issue. Can, so, can I just add one thing yeah. to that? And I will tell you, probably one of the reasons I've been at Jefferson so long is is that. I'm colorblind. We are agnostic to age or ability to pay. And, and the people who know me, yeah, I, I've sometimes taken heat because I have a patient that's used a lot of resources, but no one in, in, in our institution, which is why I didn't think I'd be there 20 years later. I'll be honest with you. I plan on going back to Louisiana. But the fact is, everybody supported it. it, it no one ever told me it, from administration, if you have the data to support that this patient ought to be treated, you treat them. And um, that's how, been our situation. How is the question of, of, we all think about how much time we have if we have a stroke, if we're going to go to the hospital and all that. How, how much does time come into treatment like you just showed us as far as whether you can correct these problems. So time is very important. And now with IV TPA, there is a four hour window, four, four and a half hour window. However, however, 80% of patients are not eligible for TPA. But now the endovascular studies, the studies that I showed you, the techniques where we go up with cat wires and catheters and retrieve clot, we're doing those out to over 24 hours because there's data supported, they're stratified. So with the advent and, and, and the evidence now supporting uh, patients, we're treating patients out to 24 hours, sometimes even 36 hours. But have they lost a lot of uh, their ability and all? Well, obviously, every patient's different, right? But the ability to get up and dress yourself, you may not be able to run a, a, a five minute mile anymore, right? But the ability to get up and take care of yourself and, 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 and restore that function. That's worth it, and we're very aggressive in doing that. That's what the, the mobile yes. ambulance will Yes, oh yeah, it'll even cut off additional time. But there's only one of those because we have a big city in Philadelphia. Well, but I think through the telemedicine program that we showed you, that, that's really where a major impact has been in terms of triaging patients. And <laughs> the beauty is, is that is according to, you know, with, but, but following Dr. Clasco's tenant, which he's always been very supportive of, is 87% of the patients we treat, we treat at the outside hospital. They don't need to come into town, right? Only 13% of the patients really come into town for the high-end treatment. So we are taking very high-end medical care, neurologic care, to the patient. Yeah, I, go ahead, I'm please. sorry. Go ahead, I just wanted to answer your question for stem cell therapies. Even the clinical trials that are being done right now, they're being done on patients who had their stroke six months to one year ago and showing great improvement. So there seems to be a bigger window, at least with stem cells as a therapy. In, in the animals, in my lab, we show the sooner the better, but it continues to have efficacy even much later than you would think. 
Yes, sir. Um, the question about the timing, if one has a stroke, is, is important. But um, in this area, most of the local hospitals run ads regularly claiming to be the best stroke center. And I'm not asking you to choose a hospital, but is there any way uh, that we can um, establish some criteria for what might be the best hospital to go to? Yeah, I, you know, I was the uh, CEO of University of South Florida Health for, uh, for nine years. And one of the things about Florida is all it takes is putting an upside down Snapple bottle that looks like you've won a trophy and put on the best hospital. And I think that that's really one of the problems that we have is marketing in healthcare is at best, uh, at best not accurate. And um, you know, one of the things that, that we've tried to do at Jefferson is we do a lot of our stuff digitally. It's based on outcomes. Uh, and I think that um, what is starting to happen is there's a huge push toward total transparency around um, what's actually happening. And I think that that's something, as I've talked to government officials, that we really need to accelerate. Um, I'm, a, I'm an obstetrician, I uh, do a lot of infertility, and it, for a very long time, there was no good database on what were your success rates. And a lot of doctors would say, we have a 70% success rate of getting you pregnant, and half of those pregnancies were pregnancies that didn't go to term. They, 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 they only went a few weeks. So now there's a very good database that you can access in any infertility clinic of, you know, here's how many they did, here's, here's what um, uh, uh, the percent of babies that went to full term, here's what it costs. Um, that's a big problem in our healthcare system. Florida is an epicenter for some of that inaccurate marketing. We have time for one more question. I'm going to come right over here. How have you found the uh, transition? I think it's the most interesting idea is to bring it out, as you're saying, Steve, bring this out to the community. Yeah. And you've established a lot of community relationships now. Some of them are formal, some of them are informal. How has the reception been to the fact that you obviously are an epicenter of uh, you know, with a great reputation for what you've done, but to bring that to old thinking is another story. <laughs> well, you know, I think one of the successes, and this wasn't by design, when we started the network, it was Pam Cole and myself in the car burning up the Easy Pass to all these hospitals. But what we demonstrated is these hospitals really wanted to do this. They wanted to be able to deliver this care. And they didn't have neurologists, they didn't have neurosurgeons, and we, we, we brought this care to them. The other thing that was very successful is that we blended in Well, so what, what we did at, at many of the hospitals uh, who had physicians that didn't want to give TPA at beyond three hours, we gave them, we gave the hospital a board, and, and I would go before the hospital board, and I'd say, here's the level one evidence, which is the best evidence that indicates that, that this should be treated. And the administration and the medical leadership of the hospital said, well, you know what? If you want to take stroke call at this hospital, you have to follow these guidelines. These are not emotional. They're totally objective. Um, and, and so they elevated their care at each hospital, and that's how we established the network. Lorraine and Robert, thank you very, very much. So, so let me just, uh, Dr. Tedeschi, let me just sort of just add, add, add one thing to this. When we acquired Kennedy Hospital, which you know very well, there was a patient in their family that talked about the difference that they could see their dad who had a stroke, that instead of having to go across the bridge and go through that walnut in Sansom and probably wouldn't be able to see him, they could, they could actually be with him. I think one of the things, and you brought up, uh, Thomas, the, the economics. Um, um, in three days, I'll be in Davos at the World Economic Forum. And the reason that, that, that Jefferson's been invited to that for the first time is we talk about health care with no address. We said that, that my goal is five years from now, if you ask where's Jefferson, I hope that people can't answer that. 
I hope it's you mean Jefferson on my iPhone or Jefferson in, in 18 different hospitals or 12 micro hospitals or 19 urgent care centers. Oh, you mean the place where the sickest transplant type things go? That's at that's 10th and Walnut. So, so I think that, that, that that's an incredibly important part. I also want to acknowledge uh, one other folks. So many of you have, have given to this, but a good part of our robotic uh, entities were financed by Dominic Federico, who's my very, very, very good friend. So Dominic, if you could stand up and... So I'm going, to leave, I'm going to leave you with a quote. We're, we're, by the way, we're giving, when you uh, go out and have a drink, everybody's going to get this book from Allison Pataki, who is Governor Pataki's daughter. Uh, what does it have to do with this? It's called Beauty in the Broken Places. She was five months pregnant. She was going on a baby moon with her 30-year-old husband. Her 30-year-old husband had a stroke. Um, and she talked about the empathy and the kind of uh, what, what needed to happen, not technically, to get through this for the family. That's a big part of, of what we do at Jefferson. And I'll leave you with sort of one quote that is not from medicine. It's actually from, um, uh, from the NBA. Um, and that is this, that um, these things are really happening at Jefferson. They are not theoretic. They're changing people's lives. And uh, not enough of that has happened in healthcare. It gets back to the marketing thing. So the quote is from Jason Kidd. When he went to the Dallas Mavericks, who were 24 and 52, and he got there in the press conference, he, got, he said, I'm going to turn this team around 360 degrees. We do a lot of turning things around 360 degrees in healthcare, but not, but not at Jefferson. So I'm, I'm thrilled that you're here. Please enjoy some uh, food and wine and get a book. Thank you. <laughs>